Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz and this is Next with Nova. Hi everyone, this is Mike Novogratz with another episode of Next with Novo. Today I've got Sam Engelbart and Richard Kim, both Galaxy colleagues, uh, both smart as heck. These guys run our interactive business and we're gonna learn about what is the interactive business, why they got into it as early as they did. Galaxy was one of the first investors in NFT projects and, and in the metaverse. They're gonna explain the metaverse, they're gonna explain social tokens, and they're gonna tell you what's coming in the future. So. First, let me introduce Sam. Sam, good to have you. Great to be here, thanks. And Mike. Richard. So we're gonna start with a little background. I like Richard's background because he was one of those Doogie Howsers. Uh, <laughs> Richard, give us a little bit of your background. Uh, you, you grew up where, you went to school at age 12. Uh, <laughs> give us a, a little history before you got here. Yeah, um, when I grew up, I, I, I grew up thinking I was Hawaiian because I was born in Hawaii and I was telling all my friends that I was Hawaiian until I was about 12. Um, but actually, I'm Korean, and as you'd expect from Koreans, uh, we get whipped into uh, going to advanced education at an early age. And so that's, that's what I did. I went to a special program called the Early Entrance Program when I was uh, 14. And, and basically what, what that is is putting 15 kids through a year of hell, condensing high school in that year of hell. And if you survive it, go to university early. And so, you know, I, I, I went to, to University of Washington when I was 14, went straight to Columbia Law after that. And, you know, I, I was pretty proud of that when I was young, but now that I'm kind of middle-aged and ordinary, it doesn't seem so cool anymore. But in the meanwhile, I've done a lot of cool things. Um, I have a background in, in law, practiced law for five years, um, then moved over to the markets businesses at J.P. Morgan and Goldman, uh, where I was a COO of FX and Emerging Markets Trading, which you would think has nothing to do with the metaverse, gaming, et cetera. But, you know, these markets, as we'll get into, have never been more connected um, in terms of the world of finance and gaming and tech all colliding uh, to enable entirely new things. So excited to be here. All right, Sam, yeah. give us your quick bio. Yeah, I was I was hearing that bio and I, I think all the time that especially now Richard and I, I feel like we share a brain on so many things and have and have so much in common, uh, including being recovering lawyers. But uh, but I, when I hear his childhood, I think I couldn't have had a, a more different uh, experience. I, I, um, I, I went I really applied to one college. The University of Colorado. I was a, a competitive skier and was primarily interested in skiing when I started school. But while I was there, I, I wound up taking a philosophy class and then going really down the rabbit hole in, in analytical philosophy and ended up doing the school thing a little later and, and went to Oxford and studied philosophy and went to Harvard for law school, um, but was always really just interested in content primarily and started a business when I was in law school financing films. And that kind of moved me out to LA during my my third year of law school I spent more of my my third year in LA than in Boston and from there I, I wound up meeting the guy another Mike Michael Lambert who was one of my first real mentors in business and we were working together for about 10 years and I, I ended up spending the first really the first half of my career doing every imaginable type of old media business and doing old media from 2000 to 2010 it was impossible not to learn about digital media and get excited for me anyway about what was happening with technology and at the intersection of media and tech and so i invested in a game studio my first game studio in 2010 uh and actually run by a guy who uh, sold that business to niantic and then is the founder of the first investment we made out of our, our interactive fund a guy named john linden started a company called mythical games but it was really from 2010 or so till now that I got uh, super interested in, in emerging technology and content. And, you know, around 2015 or so when I met you, Mike, and, you know, we were doing at that point VR and AR and games. And we had, you know, we both had Bitcoin and crypto in, in common to some extent. And that was just the journey for me sort of from uh, from from storytelling and content through the different platforms and ways that it gets told to to today. Galaxy Interactive, you know, it's a pivot in lots of ways. You know, Galaxy was blockchain and crypto focused and the interactive business was a tangent. And so uh, I give both of you guys credit. Sam uh, first was in my ear. Why the tan? You know, why the yeah. why the divot? And it's it's, it's yeah. now heading back towards each other. Yeah. As the gaming world and the metaverse is going to be built on a blockchain yeah. or, or might be built on a blockchain. But what yeah. was it? What did you see there?
I think it was the combination of a couple of things. And, and, you know, as Richard, when we originally hired Richard and you hired Richard to be the founding COO of Galaxy Digital, he came over from London. And I, you know, I tell this story a lot now to people as we get to know him. And he came over to New York from London and was running the, the FX business for Goldman and was, was as finance oriented as you could get. But we just were spending a ton of time together in those early days around the same time that I was telling you, you know, hey, there, there, there's a lot happening on the content side in particular when you start thinking about about blockchain and so many of the people and the pioneers in the blockchain world and in the digital objects world, they all came from the gaming world. These are the people that, that were the early Bitcoin. And I mean, there were people on the cryptography side and other things too, but the people that were most comfortable with the idea that these digital objects were gonna have real value and that they could- But you think about Brock Pierce is one of the found, founders who started uh, the, he, the first exchange trading he gaming is cards. The first exchange trading game, you know, g game skins, first person to ever say the word Bitcoin to me going back I wish I had bought Bitcoin when he first told me to. It was 2010. <laughs> he used to come to parties at my house and give Bitcoin away on thumb drives. And But he was comfortable with this idea because he had 400,000 people in China at one point spending 20 hours a day like mining for digital gold in World of Warcraft and EverQuest. And like there was no question in Brock's mind that people were going to uh, understand that digital objects can have value. But I, so I saw all of that and I was excited about gaming in particular and I thought, okay, immersive digital worlds. But when Richard came over and then we started to spend in the first three, four months that he was here, we were spending a ton of time thinking about, thinking about gaming for sure, but it was really this idea that, I, I don't know that either one of us would have said, let's just be a video game investor, even though I think there's the macro story on gaming. And again, having seen all the, the decline in other areas of media, the, the, to have any area of media and content that was in such a growth story was great. But it was it was when we started talking about like what happens in these worlds when you marry the the content story and the, the, the interactive experiences people are people are engaging with with all of these financial technologies and these projects that are enabling you at the time, it was a little more speculative. Now they're starting to become realities, but the idea of peer-to-peer -peer, um, financial technology and the idea of composable technology where you can really leverage community to, to, to build the things that you need to build. And, and uh, you know, for us, it was, it was that and, the, and the, the, the ways you could imagine these economies opening up and people starting to like, the more time they invest in these worlds and the more money they invest in these worlds, the more important it is to them that they get to s somehow be real owners in the projects they're building. So we just started looking at all those pieces and the light bulb went off and we said, you know what, it's not gaming alone. For us, it's not necessarily finance alone, but that intersection of finance, technology, and content creates a really, really exciting story. <laughs>Undeniably strong track record, having built great games, both at the big game studios and, and independently. Um, but they they came in and they were the first ones that really checked the box for us of okay, they know how to build and ship and operate and like you know bring a great game into the world. And they were talking from day one, from the first page of the first deck we ever saw about the importance of open economies, the importance of people owning their digital objects, the importance of of creating these. I mean, we, nobody called them NFTs then. That that's a name that's evolved over the last few years. But the importance of of owning these these digital objects and and imbuing them with utility inside of game worlds and making sure that there that there's a story behind them and a reason to own them and something to do with them interesting richard what's your favorite early early investment in that collection yeah it's 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 been interesting to see some of the early players evolve their business model we made we led the series a in a company called immutable uh, together with naspers and you know they started out building this card game on the blockchain called gods unchained 
And what they discovered over the course of the next year was the, the gas fees on Ethereum made a lot of the original vision and purpose behind truly owning your cards, just like you own physical magic cards, for example, practically impossible because of the constraints of scaling and, and high gas transaction costs. And so as a solution for that problem, they've developed Immutable X, which is a layer two scaling solution uh, for NFTs and virtual goods that we think is going to be absolutely critical um, going forward. And, you know, it's one of the most uh, interesting narratives happening right now in the Ethereum ecosystem is how does this thing scale? You've seen some sidechain solutions like Polygon uh, really ach achieve quite a bit of critical mass. And then you have players like um, Immutable with, with Immutable X coming with, with this solution that, you know, we think arch architecturally is a better solution um, for, for security and custody reasons, but, you know, is going against some pretty large incumbents. So it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch the scaling wars and, and how they evolve, not just within Ethereum, um, but versus other L1s as well. So, so I have a thesis that there's not going to be one winner. And I have the thesis because I am so optimistic on how big this, we'll call it the NFT space, but how big this space of IP on the blockchain, brand on the blockchain, uh, you know, imbuing objects with value is going to be. I don't think anyone has any idea what the TAM of this thing is. And each of these scaling solutions, if it's immutable, I mean, there, there are plenty. If it's flow blockchain, as long as they're able to bring critical mass of people to use it, it's going to be a functional and working blockchain. Some will work better in the long run. Maybe if, if your tech sucks, you're not going to work. But there's no God's law that everything has to happen on one blockchain, especially things that are going to get it, you know, hooked in or, or, or hashed into the Ethereum blockchain at one point, as most of these scaling you know or, or side chains are, are, are doing and so we'll 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 see uh richard let me stay with you for a sec you were the first guy i remember you sent me a four-page text uh on meme investing and i was like what the hell is meme investing i had to ask my kids what a meme was to start <laughs> with um i mean this was way before wall street bets a good four months five six months before wall street bets uh and and Dogecoin and Shiba Inu coin and the rest. Uh, where did that come from? Uh, and, and how did that then develop into, you know, social tokens and this whole universe of this group of, I'm guessing, disenfranchised or disgruntled Gen Z and millennials who are empowered by this medium uh, the internet being able to communicate and now financially empowered looking above and saying, you know what? Screw the baby boomers. They polluted our planet. They're leaving us with plastic everywhere, garbage on Mount Everest, uh, and deficits that we'll never be able to pay back. Like, thanks grandpa, you screwed us up. And so there's this angst of people closer to your age than my age, or certainly even younger than you. Uh, but it's showing up in crazy ways. And so give me your thoughts on both meme investing and then flip that into social tokens, which I know not the same thing, but they're both kind of yeah. new, new things that you were kind of on the cutting edge of. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this, this is personal for me because, you know, in my time at Goldman and JP, um, a big part of the FX business these days is the retail business. And, you know, for, for decades, retail, highly leveraged retail FX trading has been one of the worst business models for, for the little guy. Um, you know, there's been as much study saying that retail traders lose 90% um, on average on these on these platforms. And so when you're used to this world where retail is consistently uh, suffering from adverse selection and just other issues, it's been so gratifying to me to see that for, for because of a lot of what blockchain and Web3 is enabling, you know, my overarching feel is that we're, we're just at the very early st stages of this um, what I call multi-decade super cycle of retail empowerment. And it's being driven by the fact that these things that retail could previously only consume, like going and watching a movie or, or buying a collectible or, or these things that were previously in the realm of you know, consumption, culture, and community, they're now investable assets. And for that reason, you know, consumption is no longer this ephemeral thing that you just consume once and you're like, oh, that was great, and then you go away. 
but it's now a persistent thing that you can invest in using what Web3 has enabled in terms of fungibility, tradability, exchangeability of cultural assets. And, and that's what's driving so much of the NFT movement. That's what's driving so much of what we get excited about in the creator economy side um, in terms of instead of the model being extractive of the retail guy, like for example, FaZe Clan saying, how can I sell more merch uh, to all my fans? We're now seeing the mentality shift from how do I sell more stuff to my fans to how do I create a community where my most rabid fans can participate in the upside of this shared endeavor? It's really an extension, if you think about it, of a lot of what, say, Nick Sabo talked about in the earliest days in terms of what Bitcoin enabled, uh, things like social scalability. Now, he was talking about currencies in that context, uh, but there's no reason the idea of currency should be limited to a pure financial instrument. If you look at all of the engagement value that virtual worlds have generated for decades, um, you know, going back to the earliest MMOs like World of Warcraft and other things, what you find is um, players have always valued, uh, you know, the engagement value of these virtual worlds and ecosystems has always been tremendous. The problem has been because these are closed ecosystems, you can't really do anything with that engagement value in terms of monetization. So this is the link to social tokens, which I just described as virtual currencies with the twist that because they're on the blockchain, they have the benefits of fungibility. And when you can interoperate these, uh, these coins, these social tokens with everything that's been built in, for example, decentralized finance, suddenly you have an ability to convert all of that engagement value into monetary value. And whether that's a good thing or not remains to be seen because long story short, what you're doing is you're converting a model that was previously driven solely by intrinsic motivations, you know, your desire to be in a community. You're mixing that with extrinsic motivations, which is a very double-edged sword. It allows monetization and new livelihoods, but it also encourages a get rich quick, you know, short term game type of mentality. And so, you know, the types of projects that Sam and I are looking to going forward are those building long term games. Interesting. I mean, I, I want to add one thing to that because I, you know, that I think is is baked into everything Richard just said, but 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 I think is important to point out. And, and Mike, I think you'll certainly appreciate this. And, and, and I know you felt it yourself personally, but there's something else going on here in the NFT world. And, and my hypothesis and, and Richard is a great case study for me in some ways, because, um, it, you know, Richard is somebody who obviously brilliant and, you know, finance background and economics and so on, but has been in your house a bunch of times, has been in my house a bunch of times, has seen the art on the walls and like all that pre pre NFTs, even though we talk about everything 20 hours a day, we'd never had a conversation about art before. We never had a conver conversation about artists or art collecting. It wasn't part of our dialogue. It wasn't part. And, and I have a lot of friends like that. And some are into that and some are into, you know, into other things. And, and the worlds don't necessarily um, collide or combine. And w one thing that I think is really happening here in a fascinating way is you know, if you now talk to Richard about his NFT art collection, it, it's it's pages long. And, and, and the process of the, and the opportunity of getting to know for people who previously were not exposed to what I think of as having having been like a producer of content. There's a producer's high. There's this thing that you feel when you when when you marry like some sense of efficacy uh, uh, with with a personal relationship and bringing something into the world. And it's something that drives people to want to make movies. It's something that's driven people to want to make, you know, all kinds of things or to, or to either be a creator themselves or be a patron of the arts. And the marriage of like that high and the accessibility of it now. And the democratization of it. Yeah. yeah. And so people are suddenly for the first time feeling like, oh my God, not only can I, not only could I maybe make a buck on this piece of art, but I'm doing it in the process. I'm directly realizing this, this, this artist stream more and people have massive. more people have seen people's 5,000 days than probably have seen Guernica yeah uh, Richard's like what's Guernica yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's in Spain <laughs> come on and, and they and more people feel like they now have the number of people that now have direct stories where they can point to the artist that they helped make in this process and the artist whose life they literally changed by way of talking about their token project and so on in just a couple of months 
that's happened in, in a way that, that, that hasn't happened we, last We've got a lot of people. small Larry Gagosians yeah. showing up on the internet, yes. promoting NFT artists, promoting yeah. ideas. It is interesting. It's an empowering thing in a time when I think it's very hard to feel empowered. And I, I believe there's a, a, a lot of what's going on here. And then you think about that married with the tools that let you scale it to the entire world. And I come out where you do. All right, so Richard or Sam, I'll let Richard answer first. One of the, the holdbacks right now of this NFT metaverse world is, you know, I'm looking around my office, I got some pictures, I maybe have screens I could show my NFTs on, but there's not a physical way really to display NFTs in a, in a way that's got the wow factor. You might be able to get the Samsung frame. That's kind of a cool, that's as cool as you get. and. Even on your phone or on TV, uh, or on your computer, there's not a virtual way. You know, that's 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 mass scale that I can say, dude, meet me in my, you know, virtual man cave, and I'm going to show you off my, you know, virtual bobbleheads, and we're going to, you know, take we're going to take people's five thousand days and pull each one up and throw it on the wall and look at it and, and criticize it. Uh, how fast does that come? Are we two years away, one year away, nine years away? It's funny because this idea of the metaverse, which which has become popular, I mean, I think that the term goes back at least to Neil Stevenson and Snow Crash and his novels and then has become has been popularized in The Matrix and in, in Ready Player One and a bunch of recent stuff. But um, I mean, I, I, it's interesting I, I, just because you asked about the physical display. I did go a couple weeks ago. This is one of the nice things about New York. I went to this gallery, stu uh, Super Chief here, and they actually had a uh, they had an, an exhibit, all Samsung frames hung on the walls, and they had all, all the CryptoPunks owners there. And it was actually pretty amazing to see a, a punk like hung, let alone 20 of them hung at scale properly and to appreciate the color and 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 like the actual vibrancy of it not you know not that that's the the, the project we'll, we're talking about today but um but you know if, if going back to like why do people own art if it's either because they think it's going to go up in value or because they want to support an artist and love it creatively or because they want the status and they want people to walk through their living room or through they their office flex. yeah they want to flex they want to see so like the the i would actually say that already even with the tools that are available today um, if you are a digital art collector or an NFT collector, you can flex to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions in a way that you can't flex your art collection at home in your house, you know, other than to however many people you're willing to let walk through your living room. So already people have this ability through their social graph and exposure to flex in a way that was never possible before. And then these platforms, and I'll let Richard talk about a couple of them, these platforms that are coming up that are really, and they're being designed with different core purposes in mind first, but certainly the display of art, and we're starting to see that in, uh, you know, in, in a handful of them. Um, it, it's, they've figured out how to display the art really well, but pri you know, before they figured out how to display it to, to the number of concurrence that maybe you would want to walk through at a particular time. But, but I know, Richard, you, you know, you want, you want to chat about a couple, maybe we should mention crypto voxels, we should mention, you know, spatial web. Yeah, just just a few points. One is that because of the composability in the ecosystem, you know, if, if you have an NFT collection, you can show it off in the sandbox in crypto voxels and in, in Decentraland, all these places at once. And I think that's one of the beauties of everything happening in Web3 is just they're, they're, they're like Lego blocks. Um, and so because of that kind of permissionless innovation that's happening, I think the world is accelerating at a quicker pace than anyone thinks. I think the, I think the other interesting thing is for some of these top tier NFT projects uh, like crypto voxels, you know, particularly for the, 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 the apes and the zombies, like the top tier ones, they become so integrated with the person's identity, their digital identity on Twitter, that you, you don't even think of them as like a human being anymore. You think, oh, that's Punk4156 or that's Beanie, right? And I just think that's so interesting. Um, that that I, that association um, with uh, of a real world identity and person with like a virtual avatar, and <laughs> I, I think we're going to actually see much more of that going forward. You know, I told this story before. Sam and I were in Jackson Hole talking to these two young NFT auteurs. You know that they 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 loved it. They had the collection, and and my daughter came, and we were talking about 
you know, are you going to visit the metaverse? Are you going to live in the metaverse? And they were like, dude, the fact that you'd ask that question means you're a boomer. And I was like, no, no, I, and I was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> like, it's hard for me as a guy that runs a crypto company that loves NFTs, that tries. I just don't, I talk about it. I don't, I don't live, live in the it. metaverse. I'm not online all the time or I'm on, yeah. I might be on Twitter a lot, but will there be a conversion? Will you be able to convert someone who's 56 years old to living you know, to understanding this world, or are we literally going to just have this cliff? I mean, I, I think the que the first question, and it's funny because we, we give these talks a lot, you know, be between me and Richard, either together or separately, and the questions about the metaverse and this, in some ways, it's almost like, well, um, let's try to define it first. And w what is it and what does it mean? And are we talking about the same thing? Because there's definitely this strong version of the metaverse that you see in Ready Player One. And it is this fully, you know, integrated digital life for yourself where it is indistinguishable from physical reality. And you, you, you don't want to stay in there all the time that you can, but for maybe when you need to eat or go to the bathroom. And like, that is a version. And that is the strong version of the metaverse. And we're very far away, away from that. I think the, the, the bigger question and the one that, that, that I think is more applicable to the older generations like like us and because I'm the same way I, I I live in this stuff more than most people my age but I still dance in and out of it and prefer the the, the analog world uh, in, in a lot of cases um, the metaverse if, if what you're talking about though now are are is in some way the increasing connectivity between these different digital silos or digital platforms that we all spend time in and either you know different ones that exist on our phone and on our and you know on our on our desktop and in these areas of our lives and the connectivity directly peer to peer through the digital. And ultimately, I start to think really what that is about is identity across these different platforms. And so that it's it's more likely to be for you or for me and, and, and in the next 10 or 20 years, it's just going to be a continuing like move towards a seamless, a seamless existence and a seamless like pull of our identity across the different places that we are and with us at all the, at all times and able to drop in and and the idea that we might have orders of magnitude more real friends and relationships that we spend most of our time with connecting through a digital screen than actually sitting in a in a in an office together that's a version of you know the 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 metaverse that is something far weaker than ready player one but actually the way that i think is going to start to impact all of our lives we're, we're just not going to draw the same distinction between the stuff we do in our physical life and the stuff we do with our digital friends but it's interesting what, what you said because there's plenty of people that i follow on twitter that i just assume that's their name right and they're they're these personas uh it'll be interesting when it goes beyond twitter right when it's in multi y yeah well, especially especially as on chain reputation systems develop, right? Like the 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 moment you start to build up a reputation of here are the DAOs I've joined, here are the NFTs I collect, here are you know you start to naturally segment into communities. Like I think one of the things you're going to find next week in Miami uh, is, well, maybe not because everyone's there for BTC, but if you go to a conference. It's shocking to me, like how hard it is to find a group of people that share your interests and values. Whereas online, it's so easy to naturally segment into the things that you really care about and you just get straight to the point, right? And to, to Sam's point, like to me, like all this philosophical talk about the metaverse, I always hate these types of conversations because in a very real sense, like our lives are already predominantly digital, right? If I asked Charlie, my 11 year old son, hey, do you think we're in the metaverse yet? He's like, he's not going to even know how to respond to that question. It's just going to be such a dumb question to him. Well, right. It is to an 11 year old because he's grown up with a phone. He's grown up. Look, he wakes up and he looks yeah, at and his, his friends are in Roblox and his friends or whatever. Right. But, but, it's, I, but it's not to a 50 year old. Well, but like, here's an interesting. I had this observation the other day. I was sitting with a friend of mine who I've known for 15 years. And in the 15 years that I've, I've known him, Eric Puglia, who, you know, in the 15 years we've known each other, I figured out that there had never been prior to the pandemic a two month period or three month period where I hadn't been in person hanging out with Eric for something, a dinner, a drink or whatever. And we were sitting at lunch and I hadn't seen him since uh, since February 2020. Right. So it'd been a year and months at this point. We're sitting having lunch and it took both of us like like 30 minutes before we suddenly realized 
holy shit, like we haven't seen each other, like because we've been talking and we've been video chatting and we've been doing all this stuff. And it, it, that was amazing to me because I expected as we come out of the pandemic to feel like, like, it, like that time has elapsed. But I think part of this connectivity via digital, part of one of the weird things that it's doing is it's just creating a consistent sense of presence with people. All right, last question. What do you think the 2022 surprise is going to be in your world? Mm. Oh, that's a good one. I mean, 21 was a huge surprise, just the, I mean, the acceleration of everything. But like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if it's not if it's not in 22, it'll be it'll be uh, it'll be soon. I think actually it has it, 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 hmm. VR, I think, is, 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 in my opinion, like one of the things that has the most potential to surprise to the upside. I think we've seen a pretty, like a lot of the, a lot of the surprise is out about NFTs and all that stuff. And so like, I don't know what would happen next that could be shocking to people. But VR is something where like, we, and we've got a couple investments, obviously, in VR studios. And I was very slow and reluctant to jump back into that after having been through a few waves of it myself over the last 10 years. But, you know, that that's one of those things where, you know, with the Oculus Quest 2 coming out in the last in the last uh, year and the experience in the home and the price point coming down, like you're now you know, I'm now starting to see a path where we're, we're still not all the way there, but we're getting very close to where people are going to start and talk about the metaverse. But they're going to start like going to that next level of immersion in the yeah. content they're experiencing, the things they do. And I, so I think we're going to hit 50 million VR headsets in the home much faster than people were previously thinking. That would be my my biggest bet over the next five. What about AR? Years. I just keep yeah. wanting to put these glasses on and yeah. to see like cool things floating around. And yeah. Unfortunately, these are very foggy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's coming too, obviously, and it's coming in big ways from Apple and it's coming, you know, and, and Snap has already been a leader in some form of AR and it kind of just depends on how interesting you want it to be. I don't think, I, I think that's coming. I don't think it'll be as surprising because people are quite accustomed already to running around. You know, they've got Pokemon Go. They've got like, we're, we're, we're used to digital objects. People aren't used to yet spending like a meaningful chunk of their day with a VR headset on their head. Yeah. Richard, what's your... Uh... I think for me, it's uh, really the acceleration in, in DAOs and the intersection of DAOs with the creator economy. Um, you know, I think in the last three months, I've been impressed by how many non-crypto, but really well-respected creators, people like Packy McCormick and others have jumped straight into the, the rabbit hole of, of you know, Web3 um, and, you know, tokenizing essays and redistributing it to your followers and all that kind of stuff we were alluding to in the social token discussion earlier. And, you know, what's happened, people have been excited about DAOs since the DAO hack. I mean, I think... So just if, just, if you, just because everyone who listens to Next with Novo isn't as, as in the game as you and Sam, uh, and me to a degree, uh, just give us a 10-second description of what a DAO is for the, the normal... Yeah. So, so I would say DAOs really came into mainstream consciousness with the DAO, the, the, this project called the DAO, which I think it was 2017. Um, had raised a ton of capital. Like 2016, it was 2016. Is it 2016? Yeah. yeah. And um, it raised a ton of capital and then eventually the contract got hacked. <laughs> and so this grand experiment in decentralized autonomous governance, uh, you know, collapsed on itself because of some security vulnerabilities. But, you know, since that time, you know, everyone working in the DAO space hasn't stopped. Like projects like Aragon and others have been just relentlessly building, you know, over the last three, four, five years. And what that's resulted in in 2021 today as a creator is a ton of useful infrastructure where it's never been easier to build a global collective in pursuit of some shared vision and align the output of that creator community with those consuming that product in this kind of virtuous loop that doesn't rely on any external sources of financing or external sources of demand, but is purely self-sufficient internally. And I, I think that is something that once you extend it to existing real world organizational constructs, like game studios, for example, I, I think maybe not next year, but over the next five years, we're gonna see some massive, you know, decentralized game studios. Uh, with built-in player bases, built-in distribution, and built-in um, kind of reward mechanisms such that in the future there is no Epic Games. There's only Fortnite and V-Bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see that trend. 
So we're flipping the world in some ways where the traditional view was we work in a company and the company's got a circle around and everyone works inside the company. Yeah. A DAO is a people as company. No, yeah. one, like there's the company, but no one's in it. Yeah. Everyone's on the outside of it. And everybody's building it together. It's, I mean, we use this example all the time. It's like it, in the same way, it's so relevant for games because, and for in particular, because they're businesses that live and die on the ability to acquire users and create content and provide experiences for people. And, and so the idea of a, of a distributed game studio like what Richard's talking about, I mean, there you have in the same way that there's no organization called Bitcoin that went out and paid to acquire a bunch of, you know, super users and, 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 and super fans. Uh, it just went out and incentivized people to be owners. And the same thing, you know, we think will happen in these game economies and these places that require an enormous amount of content to be created and people to be engaged on an ongoing basis for them to work. The future is changing faster than we can imagine. Um, I'm jealous of these two. They get to work in the coolest <laughs> spot of the whole firm. You know, I've had to do a lot of the crummy stuff and these guys have all the fun. Uh, Richard, Sam, thanks so much for thanks, being Mike. guest on Next with Novo. Guys, we'll be back with another episode. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, guys.